Several civilians, including children, were killed Tuesday in strikes attributed to the Malian army in Kidal, a possible foreshadowing of the battle to come for this bastion of the Tuareg rebellion and a major sovereignty issue for the central state. The permanent strategic framework, an alliance of predominantly Tuareg armed groups, reported in a press release 14 deaths, including eight children gathered in front of a school and six notables, killed according to the CESP by Turkish made drones from the Malian army. Residents and witnesses speaking mostly on condition of anonymity for their safety spoke of six, seven or nine deaths without having an overview of each of them. Six people including children were killed by airstrikes by the Malian army in the hospital we have wounded. Said a health worker, a video consulted by AFP shows six remains lying next to each other. No reaction was initially obtained from the Malian authorities. The army indicated on social networks on Saturday that it had neutralized the day before with its air assets, a certain no number of targets which were preparing operations inside the camp recently evacuated by the UN mission. Tuesday's act of war, the first murderers in Kidal itself since the Tuareg rebellion resumed hostilities, with a state in August confirmed fears of a confrontation in which the several tens of thousands of inhabitants of the city, historic center of independence insurgencies, and a crossroads of the road to Algeria has been blowing for some time. The nation of Kidal and its region, where the army suffered humiliating defeats between 2012 and 2014, is an odd source of irritation in Bamako. The Kanos, who took charge of the country by force in 2020, have made the restoration of territorial sovereignty their mantra. However, Kidal is controlled by rebels who, after rising in 2012, agreed to cease fire in 2014, but have just taken up arms again. He's trained at least 2,000 African law enforcement and military officers since 2018 at the People's Armed Police Schools. Some regional experts say this education is part of China's strategy to promote its governance model and advance its political, ideological, and military interests. Mohammed Yasuf reports. For several years before the COVID-19 pandemic, China offered 100,000 scholarships to students, civil servants, military officers and media practitioners every three years through the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation. In a recent study published by the United States Institute of Peace, military training takes 2 to 3 percent of the scholarships offered to Africa. Paul Nantulia is a research associate at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. He says China is expanding its influence beyond economic development. The Chinese military is essentially a military wing of the Communist Party of China. Now, that is also key in the sense that uh, the, the Chinese military is also a political actor in its own right. So it also interacts with political parties, it, inter it interacts with parliaments, and its political commissars are included in uh, delegations that visit these different African countries. So that's the reason why I refer to it as military political work. The key objective is to build influence and to build familiarity and to build, oper or, uh, to build interoperability with African forces. Many liberation forces in Africa, including Zimbabwe's ZANU-PF party and South Africa's African National Congress, received extensive military support and training in China. Those ties to China's People's Liberation Army remain today. Earlier this year, South Africa held training exercises with Chinese and Russian forces. China trains African security officers on its history, military doctrine, use of political commissars in running the affairs of the state, and use of artillery, air and land power studies. China's Communist Party uses the party army model, where the military is loyal to the party, not the constitution, government or state. In many African countries, military forces have shifted away from this model since the introduction of the multi-party democracy. 
Instead, military leaders pledged their allegiance to the constitution. South Africa-based political analyst in Sikilelo Breakfast says any training that teaches the military to interfere with the civilian rule undermines democracy building efforts in Africa. It goes against the democracy as as understood by many, arguably, um, on a global scale, you know. Um, so, 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 so the omission of separating uh, these three entities, the military, the state and the party, is, is, is a, might be seen to be a bit problematic uh, and, and then poses a, a danger to the construct of a democracy in the modern era on the African continent. Some African political parties and political elite have used the military to help them run the affairs of the country and manage the population. Human rights and political experts say that has resulted in a lack of respect for constitutions, human rights violations, rigged elections and leaders staying in office long after their terms ended. Nantulia says Africa needs to keep uniformed forces away from civilian rule. You look at all these coups that have taken place, and we also look at Africa's history of military government. So yes, African countries have the freedom to train with whoever they want to train with, but they also need to take cognizance of the fact that uh, uh, that they're duty-bound to respect their constitutional principles, to respect those constitutional provisions, and to ensure that partisan control of the armed forces is eliminated. Because the dangers, the dangers are obvious and do not bear repeating here. In the past three years, six African countries have experienced coups and transitioning from military rule to civilian government has become a challenge. Mohamed Yusuf, VOA News, Nairobi. The United Nations Environmental Groups and other organizations are urging the world to stop using fossil fuels and to focus on sustainable energy. Some richer countries are funding African transitions to using cleaner energy with billions of dollars. But Africa's top fossil fuel producers say the continent is not ready for an oil and gas free future. Darren Taylor reports. As long as rich countries buy our oil, we'll keep producing it. That was the message from Africa's major oil exporters, including Nigeria, Angola, Algeria, Egypt and Libya, at the recent Africa Energy Week event in Cape Town. These nations have big oil and gas reserves, which attract international investment. Oil production contributes significantly to their economies and export revenues. But scientists say burning oil and gas for power and transportation produces more than 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions, which drive climate change. Carbon also is emitted during the extraction and processing of oil and gas. Roland Ngam, head of the Climate Justice Project at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, told VOA it's unfair of richer countries to dictate energy policy to Africa. Since the Russian invasion of Ukraine, a lot of money has poured into Africa for oil and gas projects about half a trillion dollars worth of investments. And the African countries are saying, well, hang on a minute. If we have to chop and change our policies just based on your energy projects and plans, then certainly that is not right. That is a form of neocolonialism and so on. We are talking about a just energy transition process. So the just part is also part of the argument. After Russia invaded Ukraine in 2022, many European nations cut their purchases of Russian oil and gas, replacing them with supplies from Africa and the Middle East. Vice President of the African Energy Chamber, Werner Ayukegba, wants investment in the continent's oil and gas sector to double to $200 billion by 2030. I really would love to see more projects, gas to power infrastructure, infrastructure around exploration is certainly not enough. 
And that is why we at the African Energy Chamber, we continue to plead for even more investment. We need significant amount of investment for partners across the world, across the entire value chain. But we also need investments internally. How do we shorten development time to ensure that this gas cannot just be developed to be shipped to Asia and to Europe and to America, but it needs to be piped into African power plants. It needs to be piped into African industry. Ayuk Hegbar told journalists during a webinar presented by the Chamber that the keys to Africa's progress are industrialization and reliable power. He added that renewable energy sources are not enough to achieve this.